This is the word of the Lord. It's a great story, isn't it? After this brief interaction about how to inherit eternal life, uh, two things are identified, love for God and love for the neighbour. And presumably love for God is pretty straightforward. Temple worship, obeying the law, uh, participating in the festivals. But what about love for neighbour? How good are we at that? The lawyer wants to find out what the parameters are. Who is my neighbour? Great question. Who am I responsible to be kind to? And Jesus tells this little story. Now, the first thing about telling a good story is the people you're telling it to need to understand it. So there needs to be some familiar uh, characteristics to the story so that uh, people can work out what's going on. So Jesus tells a story that has very familiar elements to it. There's a traveller. Well, they knew about travelling. There were robbers. They knew about robbers. There were some holy people, religious people. They knew about them. And there was a Samaritan. He was a bit different to what they were expecting. But Jesus tells a story that has mainly consistent elements in it that they can understand. All these people basically behave in the way that you would expect them to behave. And that, uh, that helps people get a sense of what's going on. Um, there's a 1993 movie by Arnold Schwarzenegger called The Last Action Hero. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a bit of fun. And it's a story of a young guy who loves watching these action movies with Arnold Schwarzer playing Jack Slater, who's a, a you know, rough and tough and cop guy and, guy. and he's, the new movie's coming out and he goes to the cinema and he gets his special ticket. And the ticket enables him to actually go through into the movie, strangely. And in order for that to be convincing for us, we've got to have all the usual kind of normal tropes that you see in these action movies. So there's lots of explosions and crazy car chases and all the things we go, oh yeah, we know what's going on here. This is one of those movies and you can kind of, and the little boy makes fun of it. He goes, you know what's going to happen next? You know, this guy's going to come in and he's going to say this and you know, all that kind of stuff. He knows exactly what's going on. It's familiar. It helps us to get into the story. We get our bearings in the story. It all makes perfect sense for us. And then Jesus puts a twist in the tale as he so often does in his stories. Up until the point where the Samaritan enters, this is an as-to-be-expected story. We sometimes read it and think, oh, those terrible holy people, they didn't pay attention to the man who was dead on the road. But for the, Jesus' first audience, they would have gone, oh yeah, because they're ritually clean, they've got responsibilities to do religious things, and if they get close to a, dead, a potentially dead body, that will spoil their ritual cleanliness and they'd have to go through a whole process to get ritually clean again. It would be a little bit like a doctor who's about to go into surgery having to attend to somebody by the side of the road and they'd have to go through all their cleansing process again to be able to do the surgery. So there was a kind of sense of, mm, yeah, no, no, that's fair enough. So nothing is horrifying until the Samaritan turns up in the story and he cares. And that's kind of the horrifying part in a strange sort of way. No one would have ever heard of a Samaritan doing what this Samaritan is said to have done. Now, remember, this is a made-up story. You're not reporting an actual incident. There's no particular Samaritan that has done these things. And here, Jesus risks completely losing his audience because it's so far-fetched, people go, oh, come on. That had never happened. <laughs> What's going on with that? But Jesus is deliberately trying to break a stereotype. Now, there's a long-standing antipathy between Jews and Samaritans. You might not know the background story. I'll give you a quick overview. The northern tribes were first taken into exile way, way back, and they were taken by the um, Assyrians, and they were spread amongst the Assyrians 
and they became kind of enculturated amongst the Assyrians. So they didn't have a central place of worship as Jews. They kind of intermarried and adopted some of the culture of the Assyrians. The, the southern tribes were also taken into exile uh, in Babylon, but they were kept together and they were a discreet community that didn't intermarry and they kept their own uh, cultural practices and so forth. And so when they came back into the land, they became the Jews from Judah and the Samaritans were the unfaithful ones. They'd compromise themselves willy-nilly all over the place and they weren't real Jews anymore. Of course, the Samaritans probably had a slightly different take on that. And so there was this antipathy that was between them. And so they wouldn't eat together and they wouldn't uh, fellowship together and you'd probably cross the road and not pass one another too closely if you saw one coming. But this Samaritan shows abundant care to a Jewish man. Presumably the man who was traveling from here to there was a Jewish man. And he's, we don't actually know, but the Samaritan is showing extraordinary care. Like care that you wouldn't expect from somebody you even knew necessarily, that this is a lot of money he's outlaid, he's put himself at risk, done the, the right thing and, and laid out funds to have ongoing care for a person he didn't know, all at his own cost. It really is a big stretch and promising to do more upon his return. No sign of being rewarded for doing this, he's just doing it. And you would barely believe your own countrymen would do this for you. There is no chance you would believe somebody who has antipathy with you ever doing this. And so that's the scandal of the story. That's the scandalous part. It crashes into the audience's expectations of what should normally happen. And this is the important bit. Rarely do we see this happen and this is what Jesus wants to highlight. Um, there was a thing in the news, actually, Janet alerted to me to it. She's not here now. But um, a billionaire, Robert F. Smith, over in the States, was invited to do a talk to his old college, uh, the, the class of 2019. And during his uh, talk, he announced that he's going to pay all the college debt of that year's class, which is an incredible, generous offer and sets people free from this burden of debt. And it made me think it kind of messes with our stereotypes of billionaires. I don't know about you, but I sometimes think billionaires must be quite miserly people. They're very interested in their own wealth because that's how you become a billionaire, presumably. <laughs> if you're generous all the time, maybe you never become a billionaire. Uh, but here's a guy doing something really quite generous and lovely. And it makes you wonder, when Jesus wants to mess with the, the stereotypes, what's he trying to do? Is he wanting to uh, ingratiate himself with the Samaritans? Is that, is that his strategy here? Is he trying to rub the Jews up the wrong way and go, look, see, there's a Samaritan who's much better than the Jewish people? Is that what he's trying to do here? I think Jesus was really wanting to point his audience to a different way of being in the world, a way beyond the, way, the normal ways of the world. See, the law is a wonderful thing. It helps hold back violence and hold back injustice and hold back people doing nasty things to each other. It's a really good thing. And when God's law came into the realm. It was a, a wonderful thing to kind of help stabilize society and all that kind of thing. But fulfilling God's law or God's way is not about completing a set of tasks or not contravening a set of things. That's not what fulfilling the law really means. Fulfilling the law is more akin to going through a door and entering into a whole new way of being. This new way of being shapes the way that we engage with everyone, regardless of their ethnicity or their religion or any other delineator that you might want to choose. It transforms us so that we engage every person in a new kind of way. 
And there's wonderful rewards in that. A few weeks back, uh, after our usual Saturday breakfast here outside Tom and Lily's, where loads of locals come together and we just have breakfast together over the course of a few hours, somebody who'd been on a, a architectural walk recently said, hey, anyone interested in going for a walk around the local area? And a group of us, uh, how many are there? It was about 10 or 12, thought, yeah, we're not doing anything today. Let's go for a walk around the area. And he showed us around some of the architectural finer points. We went through the, the old TAFE and down the goods line and ended up at the powerhouse and then headed off down to Piedmont and sat in a cafe, which you can see there, um, having lunch and then went off to the old sugar mill area. I saw places in the local area I'd never been before. There's some incredible little nooks and crannies around this area that you... Um, you wouldn't expect to find. Members of the group chatted together about all sorts of things. Uh, Wei and Pei were the two kids along and they <laughs> enjoyed engaging with the adults and the adults enjoyed engaging with them. And it was a completely spontaneous and thoroughly enjoyable day. We got back at about four o'clock. How did this happen? How do we just suddenly find ourselves walking around the neighbourhood with a bunch of friends? You see, over the past few months, we've just begun hanging out together. And slowly, we've actually begun to care about each other, which is kind of what happens. And as a result, we've also come to like each other, which doesn't always happen, but it has on this occasion. Often, people have mistaken entering eternal life to be about getting into heaven. But eternal life is a lived reality in which we touch the eternal every day in the way we relate with one another. And it transforms us, and it transforms them, and it transforms the world into things that are eternally good. See, if we're just concerned about status, am I in heaven, or do I get into heaven, or not, then we will do the things to attain the status. What must I do to inherit eternal life? How do I make sure I'm there? And whether it's a politician kissing babies and old people, or a religious person focused on satisfying the criteria, those who are about keeping rules and not doing wrong things and stuff like that, or assenting to particular doctrines, if it's about status, we miss the point. This is a photo of my mum. She's doing quite well. It was taken about a month or so ago. And, um, oh, there's another lady there with her. Does anyone know that one? That's Gladys. <laughs> That's our state premier. And uh, they're at a netball dinner and... Um, my mum has never been concerned with status, never worried about her, like she's actually a, a fairly non-conformist type person and if there's something appropriate to do, she'll make sure she doesn't do that. Um, but she's done a lot of community stuff throughout her life, served on PNCs and involved in community type things and started up a netball club, Willoughby United, many years ago and helped develop the Northern Suburbs Netball Association. And my mum, in a funny kind of way, is one of the richest people I know. Not in dollar terms, but in terms of her network of friends that she cares for and people who care for her. And this photo was taken at a, a recent netball presentation night where Gladys was there to present some awards and she sought my mum out because mum was the person who first invited her into the world of netball. And so They've become, not friends, but they know each other. And uh, I just thought, that it's a kind of thing, there's, there's a wealth there that status doesn't actually give you. It's the engagement with people that gives you that wealth. When we hear Jesus tell the story of the Good Samaritan, he is deliberately messing with the assumptions of his audience. And he's doing that with a purpose. Jesus is pointing to a way to be a neighbour, a way to care for one another that turns others from being strangers into neighbours. Who is my neighbour? Whoever you make into your neighbour. 
This is an unlimited category, which is kind of intimidating at one level, but it turns people from enemies into friends, from strangers into neighbours. How do we fulfil the law and the prophets? By making people into our neighbours, by showing that kind of love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this simple story, which is so challenging at one level. And we thank you that you call us not to jump through hoops, but simply to be us amongst the people we are with and to show love for one another and in that way bring your kingdom. Keep leading us in that, we pray in your precious name. Amen.